Hi folks, hope you're okay today, it's good to be with you. So we're going to continue uh, now with the question uh, that I asked um, Mansour and I've asked also Shamsi. And this is the kind of devastating question that you can ask a Muslim. And that is, have, do we have a critical edition of the Quran? That question is without a shadow of doubt the most important question that you can ask a Muslim. Because once you've asked that question, the whole of Islam unravels and falls to bits and absolutely is uh, destroyed. Now I have a number of Qurans here. I have Yusuf Ali translation. I have this translation. I have this translation. And I have many, many more Qurans here. Now in every one of those Qurans there is not, it is not a critical edition. What I mean by critical edition is, in the last hundred years, in the last hundred years, we found many, many hundreds of ancient Qurans, and uh, we have these. Uh, there's an ancient Quran in Turkey, an ancient Quran in Birmingham, uh, and there are many uh, ancient Qurans uh, dotted around the world today that we found that we found recently in the last hundred years. Now the issue is that if you read the, if I get my notes, these are my notes, these are my notes that I made on, the, these are my notes that I made on the Cambridge edition to the Quran. Okay, so just get, uh, Okay, so in this Cambridge edition to the Quran, the scholars in here on a few occasions have mentioned that there is no, there has been no uh, critical edition. Of the Quran, so I'll just get it. I'll just get the information. So we we the, these are the kind of um, scholars. So the Cambridge Companion to the Quran, edited by Jane uh, Damien Macluff, right. So, one scholar is Theodore Noldecker, who's an old scholar there that they quoted. Um, creation of a fixed text, Claude Gilliot. So, these are the kind of scholars that are in here. Now, in page. 70 okay in page 70 it says this no critical edition of the Quran which could be no critical edition of the Quran could be a basis for its scholarly reconstruction has ever been produced that's in page 70 of the Cambridge Companion to the Quran. Okay. So that's page 70. And that's that's stated. That is stated. And then in page 118. Nor have scholars trying to deconstruct the image through linguistic arguments succeed in seriously discrediting the genuineness of the Quran. That's page 118. So here you have schizophrenic scholarship in the Cambridge Quran. So I'm going to get I'm going to get to this in a minute. So basically the scholars admit here in the Cambridge Companion to the Quran. They admit and they've stated there that there has been no critical edition of the Quran. No 
critical edition of the Quran. When we do a modern Bible translation, the scholars will look at all the manuscripts that we have, and then they will do a critical edition. Mansur's argument is we don't need to do that because we go right back to um, the time of the Prophet, I call it False Prophet Muhammad, so forgive me, but that's what I believe. Uh, the False Prophet Muhammad. We go back to that time, uh, just after him, where we have Abu Bakr and Uthman and all the rest of it. And basically, we're, we're told and we're led to believe that an edition, a critical edition was made there and then it's never changed since. Now this is, and then to buttress this argument, Masur used the chain of narration to say we've got chain of narration, things are passed down. And as things are passed down, um, we know that it's been passed down accurately. We, have, we can certify two witnesses of each person who's memorized the Quran and it's been passed down and, and stuff like that. So... So, there, that statement is problematic on a number of levels. Uh, so that, the, so so let's just get this argument right. Masu's argument is that we don't need a critical edition of the Quran today because we go back to the classical time of Uthman and. Abu Bakr and all the rest of it and it was made sure that we had a full manuscript then and it could never be bettered right and the chain of narration i.e. when people memorize it and pass it on and pass it on from generation to generation has ensured that the manuscript has been stable and so Masur uh, calls it a fixed text I would call it a doctored text not a fixed text but we have a number of issues with that. There's a number of issues with this argument. And this argument does not stand up to scrutiny. Um, there's so many things that I need to bring in, uh, but we'll stick to some basics. First of all, I read these hadiths to uh, Masu. He never addressed them. If you notice in the debate, he just talked about... I, I, I read these and he, he just wanted to go on about how do you know the Word of God, Bible's the Word of God, uh, and changed the subject from textual criticism, really, to um, and canon, to this argument of verification of the Bible. Now, I said that the Bible is the Word of God because the Quran is false, and he said this is nonsensical. But I said this so I could draw him into a debate on these hadiths. Sayy al-Bakari, volume 6, 61, number 556, five, says that Muhammad forgot a verse. So there's the end of the chain of narration. We're told that there's a chain of narration and that the companions memorized it and then they memorized it and passed it on and passed it on. <coughs> And that we have right now a, a, a manuscript based on that chain of narration because their memories were able to do that. But here we have in Sayyid Bakari, volume 6, 61, 556 Khan. <laughs> Sorry about that. So. In that Bukhari, Muhammad forgot a verse. So the argument of chain of narration, and we can, we've, there's also what another hadith where another companion, where a companion actually forgot a hadith. So their memories were not as good. If the if this false prophet, forgive me for saying that, but that's what I believe. If Muhammad um, forgot a pro, uh, forgot a verse. You cannot say that chain narration is, is in any way, shape or form uh, viable as an argument to the uh, solidity in the fixed text of the Quran. It, it, it's just nonsense. And at the end of the day, even if it was true, it's not true, but even if it was true, you still have to do textual criticism. But there's proof positive, even in your own hadiths.
that people couldn't memorize the full Quran. So your chain of narration falls to bits there. And we have other hadiths here. We have uh, Sayyid Sayy al Bukhari, volume 6, 61, 513. We hear we, we it says here that Muhammad request requested seven different ways or seven versions of reading the text. Now the argument is because there was various styles of Arabic, but really, if you think about it, it's really and I know Masur will pick me up on this because he knows Arabic. But I challenge him that really that is seven variants, seven. Uh, it's not seven ways of pronouncing it that is seven ways that is an excuse that there are variants within the text and so to get round it you talk about seven different ways of pronouncing it now I know there's technical arguments that Masur can make for that but I can show positive that that statement can be substantiated by showing textual variants in the time of Ufma Sayyid al Bukhari volume uh, Sunni Abdul Dawud, Book 3, 1015 Hassan. Uh, Say al Bukhari, Volume 6, Book 61, Number 514. Um, and then we've got Sari al Bukhari, Volume 6, B61, 509. Muhammad never ever gave Abu Bakr or anybody the authority to make a paper Quran. So you have a paper Quran today that there was given no authority by the, by Muhammad to do that. Say Al Bukhari, Volume Six, Book Sixty, Four Six Eight. Uh, controversy in reciting. Say Al Bukhari, Volume Six, Sixty Four Six Seven. Same again. Uh, Sayyid Muslim book, book 4, uh, 1799, uh, Different people following different uh, narratives, uh, narrators, and um, debates about that, which way to, uh, to pronounce, etc. Now, I've quoted from the Hadiths, uh, just a side remark about the Hadiths. In my considered opinion, in reading uh, Bukhari's Hadiths, reading the Hamani, uh, Nag Hamani uh, Gnostic Gospels, and then reading the New Testament, it's my considered opinion that the Hadiths are not reliable historically. Whenever you look at real history written by somebody who's actually been in those events or knows those events they, there'll be historical information embedded unwittingly within the text so for example if you read the gospels uh, the gospels within the historical narrative will mention Jerusalem will mention various parts of Jerusalem the gates etc you know Pool of Bethesda and all the rest of it um, will have a feel for the culture mentioned in Pharisees and Sadducees. When you read the Hadiths, there's no historical information embedded in those Hadiths. It's very, very rare. And that's the same with the Gnostic Gospels. The Gnostic Gospels claim to be uh, authentic Gospels. But because they're later sources and they're not from that time, and they're by people who are trying to pretend to be uh, apostles or like the apostles, they don't really know the area of Jerusalem, they don't know the period of time, so there's very little historical information embedded within the text. And you find that with the Hadiths. If you read the Hadiths, they're cut away from history. There's very little historical information embedded within in the text. The other thing as well is the Hadiths are collected and you know, many hadiths were thrown away. So, right through history of Islam, you have um, you have this uh, political uh, bias going on, where information is being destroyed and kept away from people. You know, we don't have these hadiths that that Bukhari destroyed. 
But the point is, is that I quoted these hadiths because they're the their sources and they're authoritative. And in the debate, Masur never ever addressed them. He never wanted to get into them. He never wanted to look at them. Which to me is intellectually uh, dishonest. I'm just trying to uh, get hold of. So he wouldn't. He wouldn't actually. Um, <coughs> excuse me. He wouldn't actually address that issue. The issue is that he's saying there was a fixed text right at the beginning, and those hadiths show quite clearly that that is not true. So that is not a possible argument. Secondly, you cannot use chain of narration as an argument because even the Prophet Muhammad couldn't remember the text. So that's not a stronghold for your argument. So the only place that Mansur has to go is to go on the attack to call me gay, to, uh, he called me gay, uh, to say that I don't know I don't know my stuff, etc. Uh, just to just to go on the attack rather than actually deal with the issue. So here in uh, Sayyid Bukhari, Volume Six, Page Four Seven Nine, it gets even worse. Uthman returned the original manuscripts of ha to Hafsa. Uthman sent to every Muslim province a copy of what he had copied and ordered that all the other Quranic materials, whether written in fragmentary manuscript or all, all copies be burnt, Sayyid al-Bukhari, volume 6, page 479. So, here, the earliest Qurans were burnt. The argument goes, because there were seven different sayings, people were, um, people were, um, uh, debating about how you pronounce, this is their argument, and then, to standardise the, this, uh, te a text was written, uh, produced uh, and then the other Qurans were burnt this this proves the chain of narration is is intellectually dishonest by Muslims if the chain of narration was so powerful why would you need a, a, a paper text there is within that Uthman statement about burning the Qurans and the whole issue there is the absolute destruction and the internal destruction of the issue of chain of narration. If the argument is the Quran has been preserved by chain of narration, why did Uthman feel the need to produce a paper text and burn other text? Obviously, chain of narration was not adequate. They needed to have a text. And that's all been, been my argument with Shamsi and my argument that I'm picking with Masur, is you needed a text. When you have a text, you've got to do textual criticism. The other thing as well is Uthman burnt the text. Bakari, when he was doing the hadiths, took hadiths that he felt were right and got rid of hadiths. So there, right throughout the his history of Islam, from the compilation of the Quran to the hadiths, we've got doctored text, we've got people politically meandering and, and manipulating the text. So when... Uh, Mansur talks about fixed text, you could call it manipulated text. Okay. So I've debunked the the sort the, the basic two arguments that, that Mansur would use. I've debunked the issue concerning uh, the fixed text. Looking at the hadiths shows that that's not true. And secondly, I've debunked the issue of chain of narration by showing Muhammad could not memorize all of the Quran and secondly that the fact that Uthman burnt the Qurans shows you that there were issues that chain of narration was not adequate so I've demolished Masu's complete defense of saying the Quran is a critical edition that, that, that defense is not in any shape or form adequate to deal with the argument that I'm making about the Quran So the next issue here is um, intellectual honesty. 
So now we go on to some really scholarship. So variant readings of the Quran, International Institute of Islamic Thought, Amid Al Al Imam. I asked Masu Mansu what he thought of this scholar, and he said he was a good scholar. Now I, this guy's book was published in 1998, and it's it was his PhD. I only read a quarter of the book, but I found that the book was biased. I found considering it, it was a PhD, it was not adequate scholarship because it was not engaging with... Now this is supposed to be a premier scholar on this issue of textual criticism of the Quran and the canonization of the Quran, etc. And Masur admitted that this was a good scholar from his, from his side. I've been reading this book and it was his PhD made into a book and it is in no way adequate scholarship and it is in no way equal to Western scholarship absolutely in no way so the reason is is he's not engaging with scholars who, who, who are against him he doesn't engage properly with scholars who are against him he, he mentions Shia and and Sunni debate but he doesn't actually go into in-depth scholars that disagree with him so the scholarship that from the Muslim side on the defense of the chain of narration and all this stuff and the compilation of the Quran and all the rest of it, it is really substandard compared to Western scholarship. The other thing about Western scholarship is so so that's uh, so that's there. So I've got a few more a few more issues. So I've got a few more uh, issues here. So the other thing as well, uh, which is important to know, is we're not getting the truth in the, in the scholarship of in the academic world, generally speaking, on the issue of the formation of the Quran. So the only where Christian apologists really, I think, can really dent the, dent, dent the armour of Islam is going back to the Hadiths. That's why Mansur, if you look at it, if you look at Mansur in the debate, nowhere in that debate would he, de would he even go near his own Hadiths. He would not go near them. Because that is their, very, that is their weak point. Because when you go to those Hadiths, there's some serious stuff in there that exposes the Quran has changed. So it that is the weak point and that is the way to, to get at this issue. And that's the only way really a Christian apologist can put some dent in the armour of Islam when it comes to the Quranic text. And the reason is, is because in Western academia, many of the scholars there, the vast majority of scholars, are scholars who... Uh, re who are very conscious of colonialism. Now colonialism, like the empires, you know, the British Empire, the French Empire, they went into the Middle East and they dominated the Middle East. So Western scholarship has, has, has remembered that and has been very fearful of dominating Islam. So the Western academics who are studying the Quran on one level are very, very biased towards Islam because they see themselves as post-colonialist and they want to do post-colonial studies and post-colonial studies means we don't really criticize Islam okay so that's why in the quotes about the Cambridge Companion to the Quran there were two contradictory statements there there was the contradictory state there was the statement that that there's never been a critical edition of the Quran so they were honest there. And then you get another statement where they're saying all the findings are confirming uh, the Quran is correct in its text. Well, how can you say that if you've never done a if you've never done a critical edition of the Quran? You cannot say that with any intellectual honesty until you've done a critical edition of the Quran. So the the, the modern scholars in the academic world on the Quran at the moment are schizophrenic post colonialist. 
And so we're not getting the truth. You know, the Birmingham University uh, have got a Quran. And the other thing as well is there's a lot of money involved financially. The, uh, Saudi Arabia and these big oil Muslim nations finance universities, finance these studies. You know, so a lot of so they they get they these universities are getting funding from these big oil places. So they want to keep in with them. So we're not getting the truth. We're getting this wishy washy uh, liberal elite that won't offend Islam. Tell us the truth. Then we're getting the the money coming in to Western institutions from from Islam. Uh, from these oil rich uh, Saudis and people like that so we're not getting the truth and then thirdly uh, so I'll just come I'll come to that so here we have islamicawareness.org Quranic manuscripts and in this article it says that there are a number of manuscripts that are in the first century that statement is made based on the carbon dating the dating of texts of the Quran this article is by uh, Derock Francius, Qurans of the Umayyads, um, and uh, this article is a review of his book. Uh, Francius Derock clearly states that this kind of carbon dating of the Qurans, or the dating of the Qurans by chemical analysis, that we should be very wary of those dates. Cab, that kind of dating but here they're, they're bringing it out as if it's assured results okay so that's just an example of the bias of Islamic awareness the lack of interaction with scholars who disagree with them and the failure to inform the Islamic community of, of these things so we also have the issue of fear in scholarship. In the book Fundamentalism by Malice Ruthven, 2007, which is a, it's an introduction, but it, it, it's a considerable academic um, work in terms of, even though it's an introduction to to the topic. He says this, higher critical scholarship of the Quran using methodologies adapted from biblical criticism is still largely confined to scholars working in Western universities. So sensitive is this area for Muslims that Ibn Warak, a Muslim born writer trained in Arabic who accepts the findings of radical Western scholarship, has felt it necessary to publish his work under pseudonym. The Egyptian academic Nazir Abu Zayed, who ventured to use modern literary critical methodology in his approach to the Qur'an, was forced into exile. Higher criticism of the Qur'an, where the text is deconstructed in accordance with methods developed by biblical scholars since the 18th century, is still very largely confined to the scholars who are not Muslims. So, uh, basically, um, so I'll give you the page number. I think it's page 12. I think it is. Let me just see. Let me just see. Let me just see. I'll put the page number under the, under the video sometime in the next week or two. But the point is, is that many scholars who, who criticise the Quran textually or whatever have to write books in pseudo names because of fear so we have Mansur debating a Hyde Park who's got the freedom to do that but the Islamic world will not give any academics the intellectual freedom to critique the Quran so on three fronts we're not getting the truth about the Quran scholars are post-colonialists they fear criticizing the Quran secondly there's a lot of money going into Western institutions by uh, Saudis in order to buy off 
criticism concerning the Quran. And thirdly, any scholar who does criticize the Quran could lose their life because there are extremists out there who put fear on them. And even not just extremists, but people like Sadi Salman Rushdie have had fatwas put on them by major Islamic leaders. So, so that's basically Masu's uh, argument for the defense of the Quran. Finished. Over with. But it gets worse. If I can find my notes. Yes, worse because people like Tabari. I have a list of them here. I hope I can find them. Yeah, just just uh, just if you get a chance, read the article. Scholars are quietly offering new theories of the Quran. By um, Alexander Style. If you read that article, it'd be interesting. From a Christian point of view, read the preservation of the Quran, Samuel Green. And here is a, an article, uh, a Muslim, uh, it's on a Muslim website, it's called The Miraculous Quran, Who's Afraid of Textual Criticism? And here it gives you a list, and this is a Muslim who's, who's written this. It's on macaran, uh, M -Q -U -R -A -N org. And this Muslim has produced, and this is pro Mansur kind of stuff, but it, it's got a list of Abu Hayyan al Ba al Muhit, eight volumes, Cairo, 1828. And it goes on, it's got a massive list of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 30. It's got 30 different authors all talking about textual criticism. So even in classical Islamic studies, there's not been a fixed text that they've seen, that they've seen the need to do textual criticism. So on many fronts, Mansur failed to deal with the issue of the text of the Quran. He failed to deal with that issue and like I said I didn't want to go to Hyde Park I really didn't but I did my preparation and my preparation that I, I was doing I was doing it on the issue of the critical edition of the Quran the scholarship that I've just presented you today looking at Muslim websites the Cambridge edition to the Quran looking at Muslim scholar yeah, on textual criticism uh, that's the material that I wanted to present to Masu when I got down there, but he didn't. He didn't want me to present that. I didn't go down specifically to debate on the issue of the Christian canon. What I wanted to debate is the issue of uh, the critical edition of the Quran. That's what I wanted to to debate. I debated uh, Shamsi on it, and I destroyed him. I debated Mansour, I destroyed him at the end, but uh, during the whole debate, because we were on the canon, and that's not the area that I was prepared, I prepared myself for properly, you know, it was a bit difficult. Um, not to say that he actually won that debate, because at the end of the debate, the argument was clinched when he brought, when he, when he talked about origin, which I'll get onto the next video. Uh, but when he talked about origin and he, and he said that um, 
you know, and, and, and bits of these videos have been edited. A little bit on this origin has been taken out. Because Mansour said, I, I wouldn't know anything about... Or he said, um, I wouldn't know about the list. But actually, um, I had an article on origin. Um... All right, I hadn't read the actual list since I was at seminary, but uh, he was implying that I wouldn't really uh, have a handle on it, but I, I did know some things about that, that list. For example, I knew that it was seen as forged, but now scholars are beginning to, to see that it's officially origin. I knew the, some of the scholars, but I hadn't had time to check that because that was not the main issue, even though I brought an article on that. I don't know why I did, but I felt I, I should bring an article. But um, the point is, he never read Origins list out. If he'd have read it out, that would have proved my point, and the whole debate on the canon would have been ended, and I would have won that debate. Uh, so I think that was a draw on the canon, because he never actually read uh, a list out to prove his point. And if he'd have read Origin origin would have proved my point so he just quoted um, what's his name um, he just quoted Bruce Metzer to prove his point and I quoted Kruger to prove my point but if he'd have read the actual article of origin himself it would prove my point that the book of Revelation right early on was seen as the word of God which I could made a contention right early on on that so I'll come back to that later so I went down I didn't want to go to Hyde Park it was somebody on the team that wanted to go down so I went with them to support them and to support the team I didn't want to go down because I knew there would be this kind of dog eat dog kind of style of debating that I just felt that was not conducive to proper discussion uh, I have had two good debates down there with other Muslims who were more intellectually honest but these premier ones, these ones who were looked up to by the Muslims there, Shamsi and Mansour, I thought I'm going to meet these kind of guys and I don't want to debate them because they're not honest, they don't want you to get out your stuff. So, But I did my preparation, I did my preparation on the issue of the uh, critical edition of the Quran. And I'm winning that argument. That argument, I am absolutely winning as far as I'm concerned. That argument, I've started with Shamsi, I've started with Mansour, and Mansour, after the Shamsi debate, Mansour and another guy made a number of videos concerning chain of narration. So it got them scared. But this issue of the critical edition of the Quran, I've won that argument, that argument is done and dusted and it shows Islam to be intellectually vacuous okay uh, Sh uh, Shamsi and uh, Masur have given me punches in the stomach metaphorically speaking but I've given them the knockout punch and the knockout punch is the critical edition of the Quran so I would ask uh, Mansur, I would ask Hamza, I would ask, not that they would, but I would ask uh, Shamsi, Mansur, Hamza and a number of other, the apologists there, Paul Williams and many others there, to address the issue of the critical edition of the Quran. Because if you can't address that issue, then it's all over, you've lost the debate, Islam is certainly not the truth, and that's it, it's finished, game over, you know. I, I, the reason why I'm making these videos, I don't want to get into any controversy with these guys, because if you become famous with them, uh, Sarah's become quite famous. They'll, you get, th not not from these guys, but you get threats and you get all sorts of things happening to you that uh, Sarah's had, and uh, I'm not interested in that. But I've made these videos because if if Islam's the truth, I'll come over to Islam. 
But I believe it's not the truth. I believe the deception going on in the scholarship. And I've given you ample evidence. Ample evidence. Um, I'll give you another quote. I'll give you one last quote. Uh, So forgive me if this has been a, a technical kind of discussion, but it's just my own research that I've been doing, and I, I wanted to I wanted to bring this research down there. But the Muslim community at Hyde Park, the the you know the bear pit guys down there, who hang around Masur and all these, they just you know they just don't let you get out your stuff, and then Masur and people like that. Hamza and many others, they, they're not interested in truth, they're just interested in uh, whacking you over the head. Here's a scholar, Muhammad Mustafa al-Azami, Professor Hermitus at King Saudi University says, We must nevertheless take into consideration that there are over 250,000 manuscripts of the Quran scattered all over the globe when comparing them it is always possible to find copy mistakes here and there this is an example of human fallibility and has been recognized as such by authors who have extensively who have written extensively on the subject of unintentional authors such occurrences cannot be used to prove any corruption within the quran the history of the quranic text from revelation to compilation a comparative study with the old and new testament lester UK Academic Islamic Acad Academy, Acad Academy 2003 but he, he has admitted there he has admitted there are textual variants and if there are textual variants within any text that has been copied you have to gather those texts and you have to do a critical edition and he's admitted it he's tried to put a, a positive spin on it but he's admitted it and that's a scholar, a premier scholar, a professor, a Muslim scholar. So I've done my research, I've done the work. I didn't I wasn't allowed to get that scholarship out with Shamsi. I wasn't allowed to get the scholarship out with Masur. I was called gay by Masur. Uh, he called me gay, he called me bi. He said I'd lied. Then he apologised and said I hadn't lied. Um, he he was calling me out on the issue of the canon, but at the end he was intellectually dishonest. He never read the origin uh, uh, canon statement. If he'd have actually read the origin canon statement, he would find that it actually backed me up about the book of Revelation rather than him. Um, he was quoting scholars that he'd never really understood. The Muslims never really understood the debate. The debate was no matter many, how many, um, um, we'll get on to the origin of it, but no matter how many um, canon lists you read, there's an interpretation going on. And my point was, Dr. Bauer in the 1930s was influential in influencing modern scholarship like Bart Ehrman on looking at ancient text. And it's totally biased towards Christianity because it says there's no fixed text because there was no fixed community. So by definition, you're never going to look for a fixed text, for a fixed canon. You're always going to interpret the canon list and information from Dr. Bauer's point of view. I started the debate by quoting the ch quotations of the early church fathers, which categorically proved my point right at the beginning, which was dismissed that th the book of Revelation and all the books were seen as the word of God. But that was dismissed out of hand. But that was a primary piece of evidence and a solid piece of evidence that shows you that if you don't take that kind of evidence into consideration, you're actually looking at things 
uh, from a Dr. Bauer, Bauer's point of view. Um, so, Bart Ehrman and scholars like that are from that typical millennium, uh, uh, typical uh, theories of community interpreting uh, ancient texts of Christianity. When he's quoting uh, Bruce Metzer, uh, he was quoting him out of context because Bruce Metzer would agree with me at the end of the day, not, not Masu. So there's a there's a kind of intellectual dishonesty there which I was trying to point out. That's why a new Metzer would come up. That's why I took Lee Strubble with me because there's a full interview there and it's not just a quotation, it's a full interview so we could have read it and if he'd have let me read some of it the Muslims could have checked the actual context of it because it's not been edited whereas he was quoting from a book that we couldn't check there and then because it was a quotation taken out of context and that was my point but I was never allowed to say that so that's basically it really I've said what I've had to say um, like I said when I debated Mansur I, I, I sussed him out straight away I thought the guy isn't going to let me say what I want to say I'm going to bide my time I'm going to have a bit of fun bide my time and get to the point the issue that I want to get to so all the other issues about the authority of the Bible the inspiration of the Bible the canon I was just playing games Playing with him, messing about, having a laugh, toying with him, jousting with him. Uh, and it was a battle of wills. He was trying to break my will and I was just like, I was just uh, making sure that he knew that you're not going to break my will. And uh, and at the end of the day, I was just biding my time and I was waiting for that one point where I could just get in about the critical edition of the Quran. That Just that one point. And when I made that point, I was happy. I, I, I wanted to go then, because I thought, I don't care whatever you say. You can say anything you want to say. I've made that one point. That's the one point that I wanted to get in, the critical edition of the Quran. And then I, 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 I asked about the video, could I use it? They said no. And I thought to myself, well, what kind of people are you? You're not really interested in proper discussion and debate, because... You should let me use that video on my own website so that it can be shown that you're not going to edit it. What have they done? They put it on a website, on a YouTube channel, two YouTube channels, and one YouTube channel has definitely edited that video. Definitely edited it. So they're already doctoring the video. Shamsi, when I debated him, he edited the video. So they're intellectually dishonest. And then what you see with the Muslim apologist is when you finish debating with them, you go off and then they stand there and they give a sermon about what they think about the debate and, and, and end it. So you're not there to defend yourself. So they're always doctoring it. They're always putting their spin on it rather than letting people make up their mind. And that's why a proper debate and academic discussion and academic debate is good because then people can make up their mind. Nobody's trying to manipulate them, but Shamsi and uh, Hamza, uh, Mansur and Hamza and all these, they're, they're, they're trying to manipulate people's thinking and they, they often talk at the end of the video to, to kind of uh, brainwash people into their opinion. And then the bear pit Muslims around them, like 30, 40, 50 Muslims around them, are goading them and saying, yeah, come on, and... and, 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 and uh, just encouraging this kind of propaganda style way of debating really and I was just I just thought well I've made my point I'm happy you know so you can do all your uh, spin and all your whatever I made a point and that point is the end of Islam it's the destruction of Islam there's no way Islam can come back from that there's just no way you can argue about the Trinity you can argue about what I said about the Word of God, you can argue about the uh, the canon. Anybody with half a brain, if they understand the argument that I'm making, 
finishes Islam, it, it ends Islam. There's no way for Islam to have any intellectual credibility. You're on the par uh, with a cult. That's what you're on par with, not a religion, but a cult, because a cult manipulates the information and brainwashes people. And you have a Quran. You have a Quran. Just think about this. You have a Quran where no modern scholar or bunch of scholars have ever come together or been allowed to come together and made a critical edition of the Quran. And then you turn around and said the Bible's changed. Absolute intellectual vacuous, absolute intellectual nonsense. You're not even on the map of being an intellectual with that kind of nonsense. That is absolute intellectual. It, it's beyond words. It's beyond words. You're not even in the intellectual game. You're just not even in, in the intellectual game. So you can go around and batter all the Christians all left, right and centre in, in, in Hyde Park. But you are not in the intellectual game. All you're doing is ganging up on Christians, 40, 50 of you, with your cameras, jumping on them, picking topics that they've not studied or they've not prepared for. They prepared a topic, but you don't have them on that topic. You have them on a different topic. You ambush them. You bully them. You put the videos up. Any bits you don't like, you edit it. The young Muslims look at it and think, Oh, Mansoor's great. Look at the knowledge. Oh, look at Hamza, he wins. Oh, look at this and look at that. Not realising, not, not, nobody realising that there's like 30 Muslims around that person. And how he, do you know how hard it is to debate and discuss when you've got 30 people around you who's on that person's side, the, the opposite side, and you've got hardly anybody with you? Hardly realising that the person you're debating is so set on destroying you, so set on winning, that they're not really paying attention or want to discuss your scholarship. They just want to try to make you look stupid, which is, is not fair because what it's about is just trying to look at the truth. And, 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 and that's the truth of it. But any young Muslim out there who's intellectually honest watching this video... All I ask you to do is go and study. Don't just study my side or my suicide, but go and research yourself. Go and look into it yourself. Go and study it yourself. You know, I'm just giving you my opinion. I've, I've covered Grand Cambridge Companion to the Quran. I've, I've quoted your Muslim scholars. And I'm, I'm just telling you from my own academic point of view where I've intellectually grappled with the textual criticism of the Quran I've, 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 I've not got this this idea this idea of, of the critical edition of the Quran N Jay Smith has not given me this idea David Woods not given me this idea this is my own idea that I've invented this is my own uh, argument that I've invented it's my own argument that I've invented through my own research into the Quran and I can guarantee there is not one and I, I say this with the greatest respect but there is not one Muslim apologist not one Muslim scholar can refute what I've just said not one it is impossible and it is the end of Islam if other Christian apologists get hold of this video and run with it and write books on it and, and, and tackle Islam on this. This is the end of Islam. This is, this, is the, this is the key issue with Islam. The critical edition of the Quran. It's the key issue. It is the, it is the jugular knockout punch on Islam. And it's something that I believe that is something that I've started to argue about. I've started to develop. I know Jay Smith and others have, have done, um, I don't want to compare myself to people like that, they're amazing guys. They've done stuff similar to this. But the argument of a critical edition is something that I'm developing and I'm running with and developing scholarship on 
and I've started with Shamsi and I've, I've start, I was able to get it in a little bit with Mansoor but I can tell you now if I get to some of the other people in that high part that, that this issue they're just not going to be able to deal with the chain of narration and all this nonsense it just ain't going to work so uh, I'll just leave you with that I'm going to pray Father I just thank you for this day and um, I want the truth Lord I want to know the truth I want to know what the truth is Lord and if the truth is Islam then I'll embrace it Lord but I I believe that you are the truth Lord I believe you died for me I believe you shed your blood for me and I believe that Islam isn't false and I believe right here on this critical edition of the Quran that this shows Islam to be dark intellectually because they're just not being intellectually honest with the Muslim world and the Muslim people and Lord I can't fight these Muslim apologies because they they have 50 40 50 people around them they don't want proper academic debate and discussion so I, I can't deal with them but I just pray Lord that maybe one Muslim might read this watch this video and be convinced and, and go and do their own research and I don't expect that these Muslim scholars will want to debate me Lord but I just pray that some Muslims might see this and see the sincerity of my heart that this doesn't come out of any animosity towards Islam I love Muslims I love them to bits they're amazing people and I don't want to be disrespectful to Islam I know I, I, I've been strong at times but I just want to know the truth I want to know what's right and I just believe that you're the son of God and I believe you died for me and I believe you died for them and so Lord help me please help these people to see that that they need you Lord that they need to find you and that you died for them and that if we just be intellectually honest and we just look at the evidence rather than looking at personalities rather than just trying to score points but if they just honestly face their own hadiths face their own classical scholarship and if they just honestly realize that modern scholarship even in the west is so biased towards islam if they just get past that and they would just look at things with a fresh insight and be open minded then they'd find you Lord and I pray that Muslims will find you in this video bless them Lord and may they know your love and may they know your grace in Jesus name Amen I just want to say uh, I debated Shamsi and I just love that guy. I just think he's a, he's a character. I just if you're listening, Shamsi, I just think you're a, a character, and I love you, mate. Masu, it's it's harder to warm to you, mate. To be honest, I find it hard. Uh, 